Thanks everyone for joining today's webinar on test automation with JMeter and Taurus. My name is Ophir Pruzak from BlazeMeter. Today's session will be recorded and we will be sending out the session recording tomorrow, so no need to take too many notes. Uh, if you have questions, you can enter them in the GoToWebinar control panel at the bottom. We're going to start with some slides and then we'll get into an actual demo of using JMeter and Taurus. So let's go ahead and get started. So what we'll be covering today. I'm going to start a little with JMeter in a nutshell. While the main focus of today's webinar is Taurus and what you can do with Taurus, it's important to understand a little about JMeter just so we understand uh, the perspective of how Taurus controls JMeter and how the two are working together. Then we'll get into an overview of Taurus as well as the architecture, a brief overview of the requirements and installation, and then we'll get into actual test creation with Taurus and then test modification with Taurus. And at the end, we'll have time for some Q&A. So first of all, for those of you who aren't that familiar with JMeter, what is JMeter? And I took this from the actual Wikipedia entry. It's basically uh, an Apache project, which is a tool which is used for load testing, analyzing, measuring performance. Uh, it is a Java-based tool. The focus is on web applications, though today you can actually test not only web-based applications with JMeter. A few things that's important to know about JMeter. JMeter is not a browser. JMeter uses HTTP-based calls in order to simulate users, so those users could actually be simulating either a desktop user or let's say a user on a mobile device. As long as the client that you want to simulate is making HTTP calls, JMeter can simulate them. And I've even seen people who are testing, let's say, uh, environments where the thing they want to test is some hardware. It could be, let's say, uh, a thermostat or anything like that. A few things in terms of terminology, you might hear the, the word thread used both in terms of the JMeter interface as well as in the documentation. So a thread is basically a user in JMeter speak. And when we talk about thread groups, we talk about groups of users. Now, a few things that's important to understand about uh, about JMeter is that test creation is via the GUI. Uh, on the other hand, when you actually want to execute the tests, it's either via the GUI, uh, which is okay just for small loads, or via the command line. And I will add that the preferred way to actually run JMeter when you are running JMeter is via the command line. That's because when you use the GUI, it actually uh, it's very resource intensive. So if you're just using it for debugging, you definitely want to use the GUI. Or if you just want to test, let's say, 5, 10, 20 concurrent users, that's also fine via the GUI. But when you want to actually get into large scale testing, when you want to get into testing of 50, 100, or even 1,000 concurrent users or more, you definitely want to use the command line. Uh, let's actually take a look at an existing JMeter test just to tell you a little more about JMeter as well. So here is here's what JMeter looks like. Uh, JMeter being a Java-based application means it'll run on just about any operating system out there, whether that be Windows or Mac or Linux. Uh, here we have on the left-hand side a simple test of a, of a website. And you'll see I have here on the left-hand side, uh, these three are what's called thread groups. And very often, and we'll get into this a bit later, very often what users will want to do when they're running a test with JMeter is that you're going to have a few different user case in terms of, well, you're going to have, let's say in the case of an e-commerce site, you might have some people who are coming to the website and just doing some browsing. You might have some people which are actually executing a, a checkout process. And it's pretty common to have in the world of JMeter, users create different thread groups and each thread group will actually be executing a different user case scenario. And ultimately, all these thread groups uh, you can actually activate in parallel. But later today, we're going to see how you can actually use Taurus 
to control these different thread groups and kind of turn them on or off, or alternatively change the number of users. So that in a nutshell is just a little about Jmeter. If you do want to use uh, add an additional thread group, for instance, you simply right click on the test plan, you do add thread, thread group, and that's how you would add another group of users as such. So that's just really in a nutshell about Jmeter. I don't want to go too much into Jmeter. If you do want to understand more about Jmeter in general, I highly advise you check out, there's an awesome YouTube video called Learn Jmeter in 60 Minutes, which really goes a lot more into detail about Jmeter. But for today's session, I'm going to assume that you have some familiarity with Jmeter, and we really want to understand how you can use Taurus, which is an open source project, uh, in order to control basically your testing and control Jmeter. So what is Taurus? Taurus is an open source project. It stands for Test Automation Running Smoothly. And it was created in order to simplify uh, the automation of performance testing and really make it a lot easier to have the automation be part of the testing. While Jmeter, as you noticed, is a great in terms of a command line tool or, or via the GUI, very often you want to integrate your testing into some other system, have it run automatically as part of, uh, let's say, your CI tool or whatever other tool you're doing. And in order to do so, Taurus tries to address some of the kind of shortcomings of using Jmeter on its own. So it was specifically, again, built for developers, DevOps, people who are going to be automating things. In terms of the underlying engines, Jmeter can utilize, sorry, Taurus can utilize not only Jmeter, it can also utilize Gatling and Grinder. Though for today's session, we're going to focus just on its usage of Jmeter. Also, Taurus was created by our chief scientist, uh, Andre uh, Pokilo. Uh, he is not only our chief scientist, he is also one of the contributors to the core Jmeter project. So he's definitely a Jmeter guru. And he is also the maintainer of the Jmeter plugins project. If you're ever looking for some additional stuff what you want to do with Jmeter, uh, I definitely suggest you check out jmeterplugins.org. And uh, this, the maintainer of the site and the person who is behind the site uh, is the same Andre who created Taurus in the first place. So let's go ahead and understand a little about, I guess, what Taurus does and actually how it works. So as I said beforehand, while Jmeter is a great tool, it's a great engine, uh, there's a few shortcomings that we found that Jmeter has in terms of ultimately using it kind of as a more full-featured enterprise tool. Uh, a few of those are what we're going to be talking about today. So test creation. Obviously, it's great to be able to use uh, a tool which you can use a GUI, but very often you want to define the test or the test scenario based on a human-readable format. So Taurus gives you the ability to basically uh, use human-readable text files, either in YAML or JSON format. And we're going to show you the YAML format today in order to actually create the scenario, create the specifics of what we want to test. The next thing is test modification. Basically, if you have an existing Jmeter test, which you've run in the past, and you want to make some small changes to that test, it might be increasing the number of users you want to do, or maybe configuring uh, which thread groups should be on or off, you can do so through Taurus. So it's great for just overriding specifics of the test parameters uh, or updating existing Jmeter test without having to go and make modifications to your Jmeter test. I will add that in terms of updating existing Jmeter tests, you're not actually making changes to the Jmeter script itself. In terms of test modification, what Taurus does is it reads in your existing Jmeter. It reads in any additional parameters or any additional configurations that you might have that you want to override, and it will create a new file for you, which is just run for this specific run. So it won't make changes to your original test. When I say updating, I don't mean actually updating the jmeter.jmx file. I'm talking about simply updating the specific runtime parameters of the specific run you want to do. So this way you get the best of both worlds. You still have your original Jmeter file, 
and you can in real time, just for your specific test you want to run, override whatever parameters you want. And last but not least is Taurus provides really cool reporting. So while JMeter does have some reporting built in, and especially if you use the JMeter projects plugins, they do have some, uh, some pretty cool uh, options for reporting. Uh, I personally found most of them to be kind of lacking, not to mention if you want to integrate with a third party, like PlaceMeters will show you. Uh, and even the, the runtime uh, information that you get if you run it for the command line, uh, it's kind of lacking. And well, as we'll see in a second, the built-in reporting you get from Taurus both in terms of what you get built in and integration with third party is very powerful. So how does Taurus kind of work from more of a technical perspective? Uh, the first thing you have in Taurus is you can define the test scenario and the criteria. Uh, and you define that, as I said, either on the command line or through YAML files. Uh, that will be combined together with possibly JMeter files. Uh, and then you have your underlying final JMeter file, which is going to be executed. Uh, Taurus then will actually run JMeter itself. And even if you don't have JMeter installed, Taurus will install locally JMeter for you, so you don't have to worry about that. And then JMeter goes and make those HTTP requests or request to your website. Your website, and that can be uh, the backend for website, or maybe a mobile app or a direct API call, uh, is going to have the actual responses. Uh, that is saved in JMeter in files which are called JTL files. Those are the raw data files. If you're familiar with, let's say, an Apache access log, that's kind of what it looks like when you're looking for JMeter files. Having said that, JMeter usually uses XML in terms of the actual format to save the files. You have the raw data of all the requests. And then Taurus, what it does is it reads in that data it provides all the cool reporting and analysis. And reporting and analysis is not just a question of things like uh, performance of response times and latency, but also you can set up thresholds and criteria like that. So you can have your test, for instance, pass fill a criteria based on response times. And all that's within Taurus. So that's kind of the way it works. Taurus executes JMeter, JMeter makes a request. Uh, those requests goes back, accepted back by, by JMeter. JMeter then save those raw responses in a JTL file, and then those JTL files are read into Taurus. Taurus will do its own analysis, and if you're using a third party, such as BlazeMeter, for part of the reporting, it will also send that data into BlazeMeter. So in terms of installation, how do we actually get started with Taurus? Uh, it's a very quick install. It runs on, like I said, Windows, it runs on Mac, and it runs on Linux. All it requires is Python. Taurus itself was written in Python. And you do also have to have Java installed on your machine. Uh, that's simply in order to run JMeter. Uh, the basic installation is something as simple as sudo, if you're on a, a Mac, for instance, uh, pip, which is the standard Python installation script or packaging, install and bzt. So bzt is both the name of the package, but it's also the command line uh, executable that runs Taurus. And as you kind of might have guessed, bzt actually stands for blaze meter t, and it's for the Taurus. And if you want more information about the installation, uh, you can just go to the GitHub page, and I think I even have that here open, the GitHub page for installation, here we go. And it talks about on Windows or on Linux or on Mac OS how to install it, as well as if you want to upgrade it. And since we are very active now upgrading uh, Taurus to latest versions, you definitely want to make sure you have the latest version before you start doing any testing. Uh, some of the demos that I'm actually showing today also do require the latest version of Taurus, which as of this webinar is 2.18. So once I've gone and installed Taurus, let's see how simple it is to actually run. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and jump now into the command line and bring that up. Here's my trusty old command line. Uh, I have a few files here. Make this a bit bigger, actually, so you can all see it really nicely. There we go. So even a bit bigger. Yeah, that should be fine. 
And you'll notice I have all sorts of stuff here. We'll get into what the specifics are. But I have something called simple.yml. And I just want to show you how easy it is to run Taurus, show you an actual running example, and then we'll kind of break it down into some more advanced stuff as well as understanding what actually happened. So if I look at simple, the actual file itself, you'll notice here what it has. Uh, I'm saying execution, and that means uh, basically parameters about the execution of the test. Uh, concurrency is how many con uh, concurrent users. You have a ramp up time. You have a hold time. And then you have scenario or scenarios. You can have multiple scenarios. Think time means time between the requests. And then you can have a list of requests. Now, in this case, what I'm showing you is a really simple example, and that's why it's called simple, which is just two simple get requests. But with Taurus, you can also have not only get, you can have post requests, you can overwrite headers, uh, any type of request which you can do with a real browser. Uh, you can even have uploads of files you can do with Taurus as well. All that's covered in the documentation, but just to show you kind of an end-to-end -end example, we're going to use uh, this example. And for today's example, we're also using a website which we use for demonstrations, blazedemo.com. Let me actually show you that here, blazedemo.com. Here we go. This is the home page, uh, and this is the vacation page of the destination of the week. So let's go ahead and see what happens when I run this script against the Blaze demo site. So I'll go ahead and simply do bzt simple.yml, and that's it. Now you'll notice you get some debugging information. It started. Uh, it has some more stuff, and we'll get into all this kind of stuff in a second where it's putting the data. But pretty quickly, with literally in about 10 seconds, Taurus starts to provide some, some great information about what's going on in your actual test. And you can definitely use Taurus just on its own in terms of reporting uh, to understand kind of, in, to do actual real performance testing, to understand can your website handle the traffic or not. So let's go a little more into the interface right now and understand what we're looking at. Here you have Taurus, the latest version. Here is uh, the actual script which is running, and this script was generated on the fly. Uh, obviously, I didn't have a request at JMX. This was generated for me from Taurus. Uh, again, this is a two-minute test, so you can see how long it's elapsed, how long it's going to run for overall. On the left-hand side, you have some uh, simple console-type graphics in terms of how many active users, how many users overall, how many hits you've had, how many failures as well as average response times. In the middle, you can see the stats from the latest request. And what happens with, uh, with uh, Taurus is that once per second, it will give you a per second uh, snapshot. And here you can see once per second this is updated. The cumulative stats is from the beginning of the test until now. And then you have the labels, actual request, how many hits, how your failures, average response time, and number of errors. So I can actually see right now as I'm running this, and it could be that somebody else, by the way, is also running a test against blazedemo.com, which is why maybe it's a little slow. Uh, but again, that's kind of part of performance testing. We'll wait just a few more seconds. And again, you can see that this test ran. Overall, I get a nice high-level overview of what's going on. I'll wait just a few more seconds for it to finish. And that's it. It's done. You can see some high. So after it's done, you can actually see the process. Uh, it did some post-processing. Post-processing uh, means if it needed to do anything after the test is finished, it'll do so. It'll give you some nice average times, which is great for overall. It'll give you percentiles. And then last but not least, it also says that there's an artifacts directory. So I'm going to run this test one more time really quick. But this time, I'm going to use Taurus's built-in ability to send the data to BlazeMeter in real time, because I personally think that's one of the strongest features of using Taurus. And then we're going to dig down a little more into more advanced options, as well as understanding kind of what's happening behind the scenes. So I'm going to run the exact same test, but this time I'm going to do dash report. Now, dash report, by the way, that's a built-in alias. If you look at the uh, online documentation, you'll notice that dash report isn't necessarily a built-in function. It's something which is an alias, which has some other configurations, which basically says 
use Blaze Meter as a default third-party integration. But going forward, Taurus will also be able to create, and you can create your own actually third-party integrations if you would want this the, the data to be sent to some other third party. So I'm going to go ahead and do dash report. And one of the things that actually let me show you here is because this happened on my second screen. Here we go. Is if you're running this on a Windows or a Mac machine, what you'll get is Taurus will automatically launch your browser to the page where you can see the real time statistics. So let me go ahead and do load report here and click on seconds. So now what we're getting in parallel to all the console goodness, and if I go like this, you can actually see that Taurus is running in the console. And in parallel, you can also see here that uh, we have the real time reports. And interestingly enough, you can see they're kind of the same in terms of the, the data you're seeing. If I make this a little smaller, here we go. And if I bring up the console as well, make this a little smaller, you can kind of see, I don't know if you can actually see it, but you can actually see that this graph here for the response times actually correlates pretty well to this graph here in terms of, of these response times. So interestingly enough, it, it's kind of interesting. I always find it interesting to see that you can see both options in terms of the real-time data here or the real-time data here. Again, uh, this URL, it's a public URL. You do also have the option to store the data in your personal BlazeMeter account, uh, which means that you can kind of go back to them and see them over time. But it's great for just kind of doing some ad hoc testing and seeing what's here. You can share this URL with anybody you want. If I do a command C and actually open up a new incognito browser window, you'll see that I could you know, share this with anybody I want. This is great if you're working in a distributed team, if you think about it. You could be running the test from your local machine and you want your operations person to also be viewing the results in real time. Obviously, they can't view your console, but they can view this web page. So in terms of running it, just a really simple example, it, this literally took me, as you could see, about kind of 60 seconds to install it, get it up and running, and start running some simple tests. So. That's it in a nutshell, and now I want to dig down a little deeper and kind of understand the real power of Taurus. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of close this tab here. Uh, one other thing you should be aware of, if, if for whatever reason, well, the test is already done here. If for whatever reason you should want to stop a test in the middle, and that happens, you know, that, no, no worry, that happens sometimes. Let me just go ahead and do this a second. If I just run the test, here we go and I should want to stop in the middle, all you need to do is hit the control C on your machine. I do ask that you hit control C once and not twice. If you hit it twice, uh, not good things can happen. If you just hit it once, what will happen is that you're sending basically a command to Taurus to tell it to shut everything down underneath it. If you hit it twice, sometimes some bad things can happen. I'm gonna hit control C here. And you can see it's shutting down. That also sends the command to the underlying JMeter to, to shut down as well. If you hit it twice, and sometimes you can kill Taurus and it won't kind of kill it underneath it. So it's really easy to stop if you need. Now at this point, uh, before we go actually into some more advanced stuff, I do want to show you a little of what's happening behind the scenes. And the reason I want to show you this is since Taurus is creating its own JMeter file, Sometimes you want to understand, well, what's Taurus actually doing? And you might have a very advanced scenario and you want to see what actually the JMeter script that was running. And you can see there's an artifacts here. And every time you run Taurus, it creates an artifacts directory. Uh, as you can see here, I have quite a few of them. You do have the option in the command line when you run Taurus to actually tell it to store all these artifacts in whatever directory you want. Uh, I highly recommend that if you're obviously running a lot of tests and you have, let's say, a log directory where you store all of them. For the sake of today's demo, I'm just not using that parameter, but there is a parameter for data deer which allows you to have all these artifacts in a specific directory. So let's actually take a look at one of them. I'm going to just go into one of them, let's say the latest one uh, from, actually let's do this to make sure I get the latest one. 
There we go. And now let's do next one at the bottom. And that was two, three, one, three, dash, two, three, there we go. Okay. And you'll see there's quite a few files here. There's, and this is great for debugging. Uh, if everything goes well, you usually shouldn't have to go into this file. But if you want to do debugging or optionally, if you want to do further analysis, it's important to understand what's in this directory. So the bzt.log, that, as you might have guessed, that's actually the Taurus log itself, which shows you everything which actually happened uh, within Taurus. Then you have effective YML and effective JSON. Uh, those are basically the files, the, the intermediate files that uh, is was created. Remember, simple that YML is what I created, and then Taurus went and created both an effective and a merged. These are the files which Taurus creates when it needs to merge uh, different files and effective different files. So if you think about it, you might have some of the parameters from a YML file. You might have some of the parameters actually from multiple YML files. You can run multiple YML files in the command line. It'll merge them all. You might have some parameters which are even overridden from the command line. So in terms of merge is what it does to merge and then effective, that's kind of like the final YML and JSON. Uh, it also has a request.jmx and a modified request.jmx.jmx. These are this, the actual files that are that are created and then ultimately run. So, for instance, I can go ahead and in JMeter, I can go and open up a file. Let me actually do here, file, open, and I'm going to go into one of these directories, and I can look at modified requests. No, here you can see the actual you know file which was created. Here you can see the two requests, the Blaze demo on, on vacation. Here you can see in terms of how it was set up with the different uh, cookies and cache configuration elements, as well as uh, where it writes out the different data for its KPIs, and it also writes out data for errors. So that's you. You can actually you could I could run this locally and get basically the same results in terms of running a JMeter script as if if I were running it. Uh, from Taurus. Obviously, I wouldn't get all the rest of the Taurus goodies, but this is great for debugging to understand well, what actually happened underneath the covers. Uh, let me actually do file and open this up again because I'll need this later. Here we go. Uh, here you can see the KPI and the errors JTL. Uh, some people have asked before, well, what happens in terms of if I do want to take the raw JTL file, and again, that's the raw data file, and I actually want to do my own analysis with whatever tool. So here is, I can even show you it really quick, the kpi.jtl, that's the raw file, as you can see, where it stores all the different KPIs. Uh, and if I want to do here simple.jtl, sorry, if I do the errors.jtl, I can also see in terms of if there are any errors. In this case, there weren't any errors, so, so we're good. So that's if I want to do, again, additional analysis. Here I have the actual JTLs uh, of the, the raw files. Uh, also, like I said, if I want to do some debugging, I can look at, for instance, let's say bzt.log and kind of see everything which is happening. So that's kind of in a nutshell what's happening in terms of creation of the files. And now let's go back and understand a little more about how I can create more complex scenarios as well as how I could also make modifications. So let me actually jump back to here and come back to here we go, scenarios. Uh, if you check out the online documentation, by the way, which is actually pretty good, uh, I didn't want to just copy the documentation to slides. So I'll explain a little more about the, the whole concept of scenario building and how that works. If I go back here to simple.yml, by the way, you'll notice that I have execution, which again, this is the definition of execution, and then I have scenarios. And with scenarios, there's a lot of different parameters I can define, such as think time, request, etc. But I can also have multiple scenarios. So here is an example, for instance, where I actually have two different, you know, I have, well, this is an alias get request. But as you can see, I can have multiple scenarios. I can also use an existing 
uh, JMeter file and actually pull it from here. Uh, and in terms of the scenarios, I can also have a lot of defaults. And these will probably be familiar to you if you are a JMeter user. A lot of these things, as you can see in terms of the global settings for the get scenarios, such as the cache and the cookies and the headers. Now, if you remember, I told you you can basically have whatever type of request you want. You can override a lot of that from here in terms of default port, keep alive, and current pool size. If I go here to JMeter, you can see if I bring up, for instance, one of the requests here, and let me make this a little smaller. Here you can see I have things like the protocol, uh, I can think it's the timeout, uh, default port, default domain, keep alive equals true, uh, retrieve resources, concurrent pool size. And you'll notice a lot of these actually are familiar from here. For instance, if I have here retrieve embedded resources and pool size, that uh, basically correlates directly with the scenarios here. So a lot of the things that you can define are pulled directly from the actual options you have within JMeter, and this is how you can override it. Another example is if you wanted to use a, a data source, a CSV file, in order to pull some of the data from a, a CSV file. And here you can see, for instance, how easy it is to actually uh, override the CSV file. Again, this is a way which you could actually have all these settings within your y YML file, and you wouldn't have to worry about them being in your JMeter file. This data sources uh, with the CSV, that correlates here if you do test plan, and I do add config element CSV dataset config, this CSV dataset config uh, correlates to the data sources here, where I can have a CSV file, uh, and you can see a lot of these parameters, a lot of these fields are exactly the same. Let me just file one more time. Okay. Uh, here is another example, as I said, where if you did want to have something other than just a get request, you could also have method be a put or a post or a delete, etc. You could easily have that here, as well as a label. And label is actually something I do want to really quick show because I think it's a little more important than. Uh, just the URLs. Very often when you're doing a test, I don't want in the reports, I don't want to have uh, the URL appear as the name of the request. I might have the URL say, well, I want the URL, this is the URL, but I want this to be the home page, for instance. Or I might be a login page or something like that. And I don't want to use these long URLs. This is how you can have the label appear for this URL opposed to just using the default of the URL itself. And if again, if I go back into JMeter, I can see the name for the HTTP, oh, sorry, I can use this example. There you go. I can see here the name of the HTTP request. That will be the equivalent to the label here. Again, going through the different things I can do, I can do the body, uh, even a body file if I'm doing a, an upload. And body specifically would be relevant if I'm doing an HTTP post, yeah? Uh, I can have headers if I have the, want to override some headers, think time, timeout. And I also have these extractions, and that'll be explained below in a second. The reason we have extractors, if you want to create tests, again, this is going back to what you have using Gmeter in the box, is if you need to run a test on a website that has some dynamic data which needs to be passed in from one request to another, this is called correlation in the world of performance testing. Uh, a good example is you have a dynamic authentication token, which needs to be read in one, uh, one request or the response of one request, you need to pull out a dynamic authentication token, which is part of the server response, and then take that dynamic authentication token and then pass it into your next request, otherwise it'll fail. So by using these extractors, and they can either be based on regular expression or a JSON extractor path, you can create that simply using uh, these text files. And here is the format. Now, if you are familiar with extractors in JMeter, just again to show you, this is correlating to an element within JMeter. If I go to a specific request here and I do add post processor and I do here regular expression extractor, this element is basically the equivalent of the regular expression extractor here. 
the regular version extractor. And if I add here another element, and I do this time the JSON extractor, um, here we go, JSON. And this, by the way, the JSON extractor uh, is not part of the uh, default JMeter out of the box uh, uh, package. The JSON extractor is actually part of the JMeter plugin packages, but we already have that included for you. Uh, and by the way, we also have, I should mention, we have all of the uh, JMeter plugins as part of the standard packages. So whatever you can do in the JMeter plugins, uh, you can also do in terms of, let's say, your JMeter script. You have an existing JMeter script, which is using JMeter plugins. You can have it uh, be run within, uh, within Taurus as well. And in some cases, so let's say you actually have some custom jar files and you're actually not using, uh, you don't want to use the JMeter, which is built in with Taurus, you can do that as well. If you want to use it, I'm kind of going a bit aside, but if you want to use a JMeter, which is installed on your machine and not the JMeter, which comes with Taurus, uh, you can do so, let me actually, I don't remember exactly, I'll find it in one second. Here we go, path. So within the executor, you have modules, JMeter, you can put the path. This will tell uh, Taurus where to look for the JMeter to run opposed to just using the built-in one. Okay, uh, so after we talked a little about extractors, again, this is how you can pull in information. The other thing I wanna discuss here right now is the whole concept of assertions. So assertions, and this is again, this is similar to what we do within JMeter itself. I can actually add here, for instance, add an assertion and it can be a response assertion. Assertions basically give us the ability to add some uh, checking logic or basically error logic uh, to the request. Uh, an example means if, for example, if you had a web page and you're doing a login to that web page and you wanted to make sure that in the response to the login request, uh, you had a string which is login successful or login okay, you do that through assertions in JMeter. And here's how you do it within Taurus. Again, you simply have an assertion, and here's the actual format. And you can do it based on the body, the header, the HTTP code, uh, or you could even do it within, let's say, a JSON path and some, some of the results. So here is how you add assertions to the results. So you by using assertions, as well as extractors, as well as HTTP requests, you can really get some pretty detailed types of scripts and really handle just about any request uh, that you'd want to do. So that, in a nutshell, is just a little about the scenario building. And the next thing I want to show you, actually, is about how do we override or how do we kind of control existing things within uh, within an existing test. So the example I want to show you in terms of how do I override things with an existing test is this example here. And this is what I talked about beforehand, actually. Let me actually revert that really quick. Let me just go to here. There you go. So this is a very common user case scenario that we've heard a lot from JMeter users. And it's, I have an existing JMeter script and I have, you know, I've even seen some JMeter scripts which have upwards of 50 different thread groups, yeah? And each one of those thread groups is basically trying to define a specific uh, JMeter script. Sorry, a specific uh, user case scenario. And the way that they do it is they actually have all of these disabled, let's say, but by default. So I can go ahead and I can simply disable it. And then they'll only turn on and off the specific cases they want based on kind of what users they want to run in parallel. So I might run one test, which is just people, kind of anonymous users, and they want to run maybe a different test, which is anonymous users and also uh, uh, authenticated users, etc. Now, as you can see, this does not, uh, and this does not lend itself very well to automation. Uh, doing it through the GUI just doesn't work. So one of the features we have within Taurus is the ability to actually enable or disable specific thread groups. So here's the JMeter file. Now I'm gonna show you the YML file that goes along with it. So here we have threadgroups.yml and actually I show them next to each other. And as you can see, here I have execution and scenario. 
So the first thing I do within my scenario is actually say, I'm using an existing script, yeah? I simply give the name of the script. This can be a full path if you want, and if you don't do a full path, if it's just in the same directory as Taurus, it'll look in the same directory. Uh, and that's how you can point uh, basically to which one to use. Uh, at that point, you can say, I'm gonna do some modifications. Modifications, there's a lot of different modifications you can do. In this case, I'm just showing the modifications which are relevant to, let's say, enabling or disabling some thread groups. So here I have three different thread groups, a regular visitor use case, buying visitor and VIP customer. So I'm actually uh, using a wildcard. And using a wildcard is really, really powerful if you use like naming conventions to user case. So by using a wildcard, I'm actually saying here, I'm disabling all the thread groups which have in it something use case. But alternatively, and you can see this is commented out, I could actually have individual ones say, well, I just want to disable the buying visitor use case and the VIP customer use case. And then I have an enable section which says, I just want to enable this one here. And if I run this test by using both the JMeter script, yeah, and uh, the YML file, I'm able to basically dynamically define what I want running. So let's actually go and let's see if that works here. Uh, this is a different machine than I usually run it, but if I go here, BZT, and just one second, if I do BZT, uh, and if I do here, uh, one second, toggle thread groups. So first I'll undo the JMeter. And then I want to use the YML. Now, by the way, the order in which you add the parameters uh, is going to be important because whatever is the latest in the order, that's going to be override. If you think about it, you might have, let's say, conflicting things in a different JMeter or a different YML. Make sure you do it from a kind of least important to most important, so the last one will override. And I'm also going to add one more parameter here called GUI. And this parameter is a really cool command line parameter. What it does is it will bring up a JMeter, uh, basically a, a JMeter executable in the GUI mode where you can see the script. So I'm going to use the minus GUI here. And it's thinking a second. And it just brought up JMeter. And it's actually, it's a different window. Let me bring up this window. The test is running here, but it, in parallel, here we go, in parallel, it brought up this screen. And as you can see, this is the actual JMeter script. You can see also it's modified. I mean, the name of the file is something which is temporary. But here you can see, voila, that the regular visitor use case and the buying visitor use case is off. But the VIP customer use case, that one's actually on. So by, uh, by uh, doing the, the GUI option, basically what I'm doing is uh, enabling you to see in real time the actual thread that is being used. Uh, this actually isn't going to work for obvious reasons, just a second, because uh, I didn't tell it what website to actually uh, hit. This, this was kind of made more of an example just to show you how it's running. I just realized now in terms of the request defaults, what I should have done and what I can actually uh, go here is if I would have put the request defaults not just to use, let me actually bring this up again. Here we go. Or you know, let's actually do that one more time. I think I accidentally missed that. Uh, aha, okay, just one second. Just one second. I, I have a little mistake there. And let me actually do that again. Uh, okay, you really think I stand corrected. What actually happened uh, was that when you do it in GUI mode, it'll actually wait for me to run it in GUI mode in order to get results. Uh, you know what, wait one second. That was my bad, the wrong one. I have, I have like five JMeter instances here running uh, on my machine. I think I need to close some of them. I have a little few too many. Here we go. And let's do this one more time. Second. Uh, 
There we go. So here's actually JMeter script. And if I hit the run here, well, it, it ran kind of fast uh, because I only had one concurrent user. Uh, but uh, basically what will happen, and again, this wasn't set up to actually run. This was set up more as an example. Uh, once it starts to run, here we go, then you'll actually be able to, to see the results as well when you run it within JMeter. Now, another cool thing that I want to point out in terms of when you are using uh, the ability to override stuff within BlazeMeter for different thread groups as, uh, let me actually bring up the original one really quick. Uh, just one second, let me actually bring up one second, and then going to bring up, you know, let me load it here. Let's do here a file toggle thread groups. Here we go. So here's the original one. And let's say I actually have a user case, which is more realistic, where regular users, I want, let's say, uh, 50 regular users and buying users, I want 20 and VIP users, I want just five. So I have here 50, 20 and five. So kind of have 75 users total in terms of how I have the number of users in each thread group. One of the cool things about when you use Taurus is that if you override the number of users and you can override the number of users from the YML file uh, and even and what it'll do is it'll override the thread groups in your uh, JMeter script. So even though I've defined here 50 and 20 and five, if I go in my Taurus and if I say, let me go back to this here, if I say concurrency, let's say 150 opposed to whatever it is, what Taurus does, and this is really, really smart, Taurus will look for all of the enabled thread groups and distribute the number of users proportionally to the number of threads which were originally defined in that thread group. So for instance, if in this case, if I went from concurrency, if I had your 150, it would basically double the amount of whatever I have here since originally I defined it as 50 and uh, 50 and 20 and five. So each one would get double. But let's say for instance, I ran a test and the VIPs were, were, uh, were active for that test, they were disabled. So I only have 50 and 20. Taurus will still keep the same proportion. So if I defined 150 users, in that case, I don't know the math offhand, but basically you would have uh, you know, the same proportion of 50-20, you would have that same proportion, but with 150 users. So it makes it really, really easy to basically you know, run tests with however number of users you want and still keep the proportions and enable you to enable or disable. Now, a lot of the th other things you can do in terms, of, uh, in terms of what you can turn on or off uh, are, are specifically the options for, uh, just one second, are specifically the options uh, for basically anything almost within your test. Uh, th there's a quick question I have here, and I want to leave time for QA. There's a quick question, how come we didn't see the dashboards when I ran those tests? Excellent question. Uh, I, I ran this with a GUI option, yeah? Instead of the GUI option, if I run this with a report option, yeah? What will happen is that when I do report, that's when I get the cool blaze meter things and actually run this. Uh, actually, I just realized, I think it's run with just one concurrent user. So I wouldn't need to override that uh, to have more than one concurrent user. I don't know for the parameters in which I ran this. So we might not have too much data here, to be honest. Uh, but by just making sure you add dash report, you're always gonna get blaze meters really cool data. And again, I just realized I only had one user. I would need to update that with concurrency to, to larger numbers. Uh, there's another question here that I have that I wanna answer because it was covered beforehand uh, in terms of uh, what if I have local jar files for my local JMeter uh, installation? So that goes back to saying, if you go to the configuration and you basically tell it where to run JMeter from, uh, sorry, I'm at command. Execution, here we go. So if I tell it to do JMeter, when I tell the path, if I'm pointing it not towards my Taurus installation, but towards my local installation, it will use the specifics to the local installation. Uh, 
Now, there's a lot of other stuff. What I really wanted to do in today is just kind of show you the high level uh, of what Taurus can do and how it works. Ultimately, if you check out the online documentation, uh, there is a lot more than we have time to go into, and we'll definitely have a follow-up in terms of kind of some more of the specifics, in terms of kind of just to go over quickly to, to mention what we have here. Uh, you know, you have the execution settings in terms of if you have existing scripts, the different scenarios, the load files, sorry, the load profiles in terms of concurrency, you ramp up, hold iterations, or even throughput. Uh, JMeter properties, which you can override any JMeter properties. This is really powerful if you have a script, for instance, which you have, I don't know if you're familiar with the underscore underscore P parameter. There's a way within your JMeter script which you can basically create it to pass in command line parameters. These are JMeter properties. You can override those here by using the modules JMeter and properties. And for instance, my host name is a good example. And here's the open JMeter GUI, which again, it'll show you to open it up. Uh, you can even run JMeter in distributed mode where you might have multiple machines which are gonna be executing. Uh, and here's a good example, like I said, of modification for existing threat scripts uh, where you might want to enable or disable certain thread groups, uh, have certain variables which you can override as well as set some properties if you want. And I'm going to pass on the Gatling of the Grinder executors. Uh, in terms of configuration, as I said beforehand, there's a lot of different ways you can configure it. The overall documentation is pretty good. But in terms of the different parts of the syntax, you have execution type parameters, reporting parameters, scenarios, modules, settings, and provisionings, which is advanced. But just going over these, these options in the uh, online documentation, you can see how it works in terms of merging multiple files. They also have command line, module settings. For now, there's probably not that much you need to deal with module settings. We have a, uh, a blaze emitter module, but in the future, we can definitely have other modules. Uh, one cool thing, for instance, is human readable time specifications. You can write MS for milliseconds, or you can write S, M, H, and D for day, hour, minute, and second, as you might, uh, might imagine, etc. Uh, another cool thing, if you really want to do, if you're on a Linux or a Mac, is you can actually have the first line of your YML file, uh, basically have that be a pointer to your local BZT, change that to an executable. This is kind of like you do with a shell script to make it executable, and then you can just simply run the script itself. Uh, in terms of command line, a few things which you should be aware of the command line. Uh, obviously, help, choir, verbose. Uh, one thing which is very helpful is the data deer. There is no, currently there's no way to override the data directory. That's where you actually want all the information to go to. You can override that. And another really important thing in terms of configuration files is the ability to have a per user slash per machine configuration file. So, for instance, the user example which you'd probably want to use this is, let's say you have a uh, API key, and that's an API key just for you. You could store that API key in your local bzt.rc file. That's basically a, a YML file, yeah. Uh, and within that file, you could actually have your your local API key. What will happen is that when you actually go and run the test, anything which is in your uh, local BZTRC file is not appended to the actual artifacts directory. I know that's a little complicated, but I just kind of want to make sure you guys are uh, uh, aware of how I can still run tests with information which is sensitive that I want don't want to be as part of all the artifacts. Uh, at this point, I feel like we covered a ton of stuff uh, I want to make sure we still have a few minutes left for Q&A, so I will open it up for Q&A. Uh, last but not least, I definitely have to mention, are the forums. So I'm going to actually go here to Taurus. If I go to the Taurus, forget where the forums are, just go to the Taurus homepage. Yeah, if you just do a search for Blazemeter Taurus, uh, the quick links for the documentation, as I've been showing you. There is a video from a webinar that I gave in the past specifically about integration of Taurus and Jenkins. And last but not least is the support forum, which has become very active. And the support forum, uh, if, if you have any issues, if you have any questions, this is a place to do it. 
Um, and fortunately, uh, we usually are able to answer questions within just a few hours of the same day. So at this point, I will open it up to questions. Let me kind of go through here and take a look at the questions. Uh, so there's some questions about, again, the, the, uh, the directories. So as I said beforehand, if you have questions about the directories, you can point Taurus to use your local Jmeter installation through the, uh, through the, wait, just one second, through the, ah, not the command line tool. Here you go. Through the execution settings. The execution settings give you the ability to tell uh, Taurus where you have your local Jmeter, and that's where it'll basically point to uh, your local Jmeter. Uh, there's another question. Uh, how does a Jmeter script get loaded into the load generators when you're doing distributed testing with Taurus? That's an excellent question. So uh, Taurus uses Jmeter's distributed testing mechanism. Uh, without going too much into Jmeter's distributed testing mechanism, uh, when you run a test with Taurus in distributed mode, it's basically executing Jmeter's own distributed testing method, which I have to say from experience, can sometimes get really uh, complex in terms of making it work, uh, but it takes care of everything for you, and that's how the script basically gets loaded. Uh, Taurus, it takes care of, it, of itself. Basically, as long as you have those uh, slaves which are running, then the script gets uh, generated for itself. Uh, looking at some more questions, uh, somebody asks, well, what if, okay, so there were some questions about what if I use Gatling or Grinder, uh, and I want to be able to use Torch to take advantage of Gatling or Grinder? So that again is beyond the scope of today's uh, of today's session. I will say that you can check out here uh, in terms of the Gatling executor and the Grinder executor. If you have questions, you can check them out here. Uh, let me see other questions. Another question. Uh, how many concurrent users can Taurus handle? So uh, the question really is in terms of how many concurrent users, that's really ultimately how many concurrent users your machine can handle. Uh, ultimately, you do need to take a look at the CPU of the machine running Taurus. If I'm on a Mac, I can actually look at my activity monitor and really easily just make sure I'm not hitting 100% CPU. Uh, if you're running on whatever machine, you definitely want to take a look at the machine in terms of, uh, you know, how many concurrent users you can handle. Just make sure you're not hitting 100% CPU, and you should uh, should be able to 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 handle it. Uh, another question about the video recording. So again, we will send out an email within 24 hours to everybody who attended, and that email will include a link to the recording. Uh, another question somebody is asking, okay, so there's a question which is a little complex. I'm not sure I can answer it here. It's how do I make the URL variable when the application uh, is moved to another server and I want to use the same script with a modified URL? So if I, okay, if I understand you correctly, is basically... I have an existing script, and let's say within that script, so here's an excellent question. I have an existing script. Let's say this is my script. And in this script, let me take here, I have under main page, I have the server name, yeah? And the server name might be www.site.com. And now I want to take the same script and basically say, well, actually, I don't want to run it on site.com. I want to run it on dev.site.com. Excellent question. That's really a Jmeter question, but I'll show you how to use both Jmeter and Taurus in conjunction. Instead of doing it this way, what you probably want to do is use HTTP request defaults. And you'll notice here it's blazed down. So already have it. It's already blazeddemo.com. This is already set up. So the first thing you want to have is HTTP request defaults. But instead of having it hard coded, and if I go back to here, if I leave this empty, then all HTTP requests will be using the request defaults. But if I leave this empty, what I can do, and this is where it gets really cool, if I do dollar open curly brackets, underscore, underscore, capital P, open, um, open parentheses, I put in the name of a variable, so let's call this my dash site, comma, and what the default value should be. If I don't pass anything in, 
close, close. So what I just did here basically is I'm telling JMeter, I want this value to be read from a command line parameter, a property I should say, called my site. And if I don't have anything which is passed in, I want you to use a default of blazemeter.com. Now, how do I actually pass that in? If I go here to Taurus and I go here to, uh, I think it was scenario building. No, it wasn't scenario building. Sorry, my bad. It was in the execution settings, I think. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Really here we go. So under execution settings, I have modules, JMeter, properties. And properties, this is a place that I can override the properties. So here I actually have, if I had my dash host name, and this is one of the properties which in my JMeter script, here we go, not my site, if it was my host name, whatever it is, my host name, here we go, then basically it would read this value. But if I didn't pass anything in, it would just be using Blaze Demo. Uh, Another question, so uh, that's actually beyond the scope. It's a good question. If I run a test with multiple JMeter servers, uh, can I still uh, get the BlazeMeter reports? Yes, so if you're running a distributed test, again, JMeter is still taking care of distributing all the information and passing it into the Taurus which you're using, the instance which you're using to run the test, it'll still all be passed back into, into BlazeMeter. Uh, I think that's it, all we have time for today. So if you do have additional questions, please uh, send an email. Actually, go here to the end. Don't go away yet. Don't go away yet, please. Uh, we have here, sorry, wrong one. We have here, uh, here we go. So if you send an email to info at blazemeter.com, if you have additional questions, if you want a demo or stuff like that, you can do so here. If it's a Taurus question, again, if it's a Taurus question, don't send it to info.blazemeter. If it's a Taurus question, please go to the Taurus forum, which is here, and ask it here, and we will answer you as quickly as possible. If it's a Blazemeter question, you can send us. Uh, so again, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, if, again, if you do have any questions, definitely go to the Taurus, uh, to the Taurus site. And if you, Stay for just one more second. Actually, there's a, a quick survey at the end here that I really appreciate. Uh, 